Okay, we're back. Uh, the second, um, second video for uh, um, chapter five, uh, the working cell. Talking about enzyme uh, activity, and we're going to talk about uh, talk about the same thing in uh, actually next week's uh, lab when we have the enzyme lab. Okay. Enzyme is very selective in the reaction of catalyzers, as I mentioned before. Usually they, they only catalyze one particular uh, uh, reaction, usually. There's a few that, record, that can uh, catalyze uh, a few similar type of reactions, but mostly they're very, very selective. Okay, each enzyme recognizes a substrate, a certain reactant molecule. So remember in a chemical reaction, you have reactants over here, and then you have an arrow and you go to products. All right, so, uh, um, and uh, the reactants in a uh, enzymatically catalyzed uh, chemical reaction is, is called the substrate or substrates if there's more than one. Okay. Um, now, so the enzyme binds to the substrate to form an enzyme substrate complex. This and the substrate binds in a place on the enzyme called the active site. And it has a complementary shape to the, uh, to the molecule it's binding with. Uh, it's often called a uh, lock and key. This is, interaction is called deuce fit um, because this uh, substrate induces the enzyme to change shape slightly, but it's more um, uh, lock and key makes it clear without, you know, why does a, a, a key turn a lock? It's because it's got a shape, it's got the right shape. And the key, at, the lock is a particular shape and the key has a complementary shape, fits in and you can turn it. Same thing with, uh, with the substrate in the active site. So after products are released from the active site, the enzyme can accept other molecules of its substrate. The ability to function repeatedly is a key characteristic of enzymes. So this is why, uh, say a catalyst, um, when well, enzyme is a biological catalyst, a catalyst is a molecule that speeds up a chemical reaction, remember, and doesn't get used up in the process. So, um, so the enzyme can work, uh, transform this molecule, go back to another molecule, do it again, and again, and again, and again. It never gets used up or changed in any long-term way by the process. And, this is, and the, how fast it moves is called the turnover rate. How many molecules can, can, can it transform per second? It's a turnover rate. Um, now, eventually they break down and you're gonna make new ones, but they're not changed at all by the reaction that they catalyze. Okay. Many enzymes are named for their, substance, for their substrates, but with an ASE ending. Uh, most enzyme, enzymes end in ASE. We talked about uh, lactose, milk sugar. What's the enzyme that breaks it down? Lactase. So, uh, cellulose. What's the enzyme that breaks it down? Cellulase, so on and so forth. Not all enzymes end in ASE, but most of them do. How does an enzyme recognize a substrate? Shape. It all comes down to molecular shape. As a matter of fact, the, a lot of um, homeostatic variables like body temperature, uh, like blood pH, all comes down to maintaining the shape of enzymes. We're gonna find out that pH and temperature change the shape of enzymes. And we can't let that happen. Uh, enzymes are critically important for life. If they change your shape, they may not work as well. If they don't work as well, you may not work as well. Um, so it really comes down to maintaining the shape of uh, your protein molecules. Not only enzymes, but also signaling molecules and cell ID molecules are all proteins with a particular shape and they gotta stay that way. So here it is, how an enzyme works. Active site ready for uh, uh, enzyme. So we're looking at that. Matter of fact, we're looking at lactase here. Uh, so the substrate is lactose. It binds 
uh, the binding stretch, stretches the, the bond between, uh, uh, between the two sugar molecules. It breaks it apart to glucose and galactose. Now the active site is open again, binds another molecule of lactose, it goes again and again and again until there isn't any lactose left. So there's the enzyme substrate complex right here. Okay, enzymes unravel and stop function if the environment gets too hot. Is your theme of this? Again, it's relationship structure to function. Uh, it, uh, enzymes are held together by weak molecular interactions, hydrogen bonds for the most part. And um, you know what uh, heat does to hydrogen bonds? Uh, it, it, it breaks them. Um, and you know what uh, the high hydrogen ion concentration or high hydroxide concentration could do? It can bind to amino acids, change, uh, uh, break hydrogen bonds and change its shape. Okay, now you gotta regulate these, these, these uh, enzymatic reactions, all right? Um, and certain molecules inhibit a metabolic reaction by binding to an enzyme and disrupting its function. Some of these are enzyme inhibitors. Uh, some of these enzyme inhibitors are actually substrate imposters that plug up the active site. Um, they're called competitive inhibitors because they compete uh, with the natural substrate for the active site. They have the same shape and can fit the uh, active site, but they don't do anything when they get there. So they can really turn off an, an enzyme. And that's exactly how um, a lot of drugs work. They're substrate imposters, they're competitive inhibitors. Um, uh, to to an enzyme and uh, and so it it it, it uh, when well each case an inhibitor and who dis disrupts the function of the enzyme by altering its shape no it binds no it plugs up the active site which does alter its shape a little bit so those are called competitive inhibitors and like, as I said a lot of um, drugs work that way but in the body. It, uh, your cells don't regulate enzymes by competitive inhibition. They regulate enzymes by what's called non-competitive inhibition, which I'm gonna show you, I think, on the next slide. Okay, enzyme inhibitors. There's the enzyme, um, there's the active site, and on top here, we have the substrate binding to, uh, to it, and, uh, and uh, the enzyme reaction continues. Now look at the other side of the enzyme over here. This is another site. And I don't know why the book doesn't um, name that site. Um, this is where what's called a, a non-competitive inhibitor is bound. So I'm gonna give you it, write this down in your notes because it ain't in the book. Allosteric site, A-L-L-O-S-T-E-R-I-C. So we got the active site and all enzymes have an active site. And then you have the allosteric site on the other side of, of the molecule. Not every enzyme's got an allosteric site, but, but a lot of them do, okay? And, okay, so first look at the, what's called competitive inhibition by a substrate imposter. Here's this red molecule here. It's got the same shape as the substrate, so it binds instead of the substrate and it doesn't get acted upon. So it turns off the enzyme and you can't, the enzyme won't work until you get, until you get rid of that. And uh, so that drug blocks the enzyme and the drug breaks down. And then the, 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 uh, the enzyme can work again, but uh, if you keep taking the drug, you can keep on inhibiting this enzyme. Okay. C, inhibition of an enzyme by a molecule that causes the active site to change shape. Uh, called the non-competitive inhibition. Non-competitive because it's not competing uh, with anything for the allosteric site. It binds to the allosteric site and nothing else binds to the allosteric site. It has nothing to do with binding to the active site. But what happens when the uh, non-competitive inhibitor binds um, 
daily out of steric site is that it causes the, the active site on the other side of, of the molecule to change shape. So the substrate can't fit anymore. So it turns it off. And it's off until the uh, non-competitive inhibitor leaves the allosteric site. Then the active, active site uh, changes back to its natural shape. Subject can buy, you turn the enzyme on. So you can turn it off and you can turn it on. And uh, one really great uh, example of this is called end product inhibition. And that is, if you have this series of reactions, a metabolic pathway, that you start with this substrate here, you change it to this, then change it to this, you change it to this, and you change it to the final product that you need, okay? And there's an enzyme along the way for each reaction is an enzyme. So you wanna make this, this last product, but you don't wanna make too little of it. You don't wanna make too much of it. Great example is ATP. This happens in making ATP. You wanna make just the right amount of ATP. Uh, because if you, uh, if you don't make enough, you can't do enough work to keep your cells alive. If you make too much, you'll waste it and you'll get overheated because it'll be start breaking down and causing heat and you'll be wasting, uh, and you're wasting energy. So you don't want too little, uh, not too much, you just, you just want the right amount, okay. So you start with glucose and you break it down and you end up with ATP. Okay, so uh, what the, 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 um, the really great part of this end product inhibition is the product at the, the last thing you're making is a non-competitive inhibitor to the first enzyme in the metabolic pathway. So it's the non-competitive inhibitor. So ATP binds to this, to this um, uh, enzyme called hexokinase, which you don't have to know. That starts the first uh, is the first step in the pathway to make ATP. So the ATP it, you make a lot of ATP, that excess ATP comes back, binds to the hexokinase, turns it off. So you don't make any ATP. So then you use the ATP to do work. And that ATP uh, when ATP uh, concentration gets low, the ATP comes off the allosteric site. Hexokinase is turned on the whole metabolic, metabolic pathway is turned on, they make more ATP. So that's how you, uh, the cells can, uh, can, can manage this and regulate how much product they make. Okay, your ability to walk depends on a coordination of many different enzymes and other cellular structures. Major theme, interactions within biological systems. So another way to, what, another thing cells have to regulate is the flow of materials into and out of cells from the environment. And that happens across the plasma membrane or the cell membrane, which is a double layer of fat with embedded proteins. Um, so um, we can talk about things moving across the membrane and for nonpolar things, there's no trouble getting across the membrane. Because remember, it's a it's a uh, it's a fat layer, the, the membrane. So fat soluble stuff comes right across or leaves. It comes. The cell can't regulate those molecules. It can only regulate polar molecules because polar molecules are blocked by this fat boundary. Okay. So, may, uh, so um, we're gonna look at the functions of some of these membrane proteins. One of the big functions transport proteins to transport polar molecules across the membrane. Okay, primary functions of membrane proteins. There's the phospholipid bilayer. And let's look at all these different kinds of uh, 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 membrane proteins. Some membrane proteins are enzymes, all right? Some membrane proteins down here attach uh, that cytoskeleton um, attached to a skeleton extracellular matrix, and they are the anchors that these protein filaments attach to and give the cell its shape. Uh, cell signaling proteins. Um, 
that there were receptors uh, on your cells for, for uh, protein hormones that were attached to a membrane receptor and this would cause a change inside the cell through what's called a second messenger. And so that, those are important. Um, transport proteins, as I just mentioned, some of the transport proteins are just holes in the membrane that allow ions to cross, right? And each ion has a different um, specific um, uh, transport protein called, uh, called an ion channel. So you have sodium ion channels, potassium ion channels, chloride ion channels, calcium ion channels. Sometimes you have to interact more with the molecule to bring it across. And, uh, and that's called facilitate diffusion. And that's a, that's a transport protein that actually attaches to the molecule and brings it across. It's not just a hole in the membrane. Okay, intercellular joining. You gotta join cells together into tissues. Membrane proteins do that. Cell cell recognition. Cells have to recognize each other. Particularly your immune, sy your immune system has to recognize your cells because you have certain receptors on your, on your uh, cells that, that are unique to you and the immune system uh, recognizes those and says, okay, you're okay. You got the right membrane proteins. If I see some cell with, without the right membrane proteins, we're gonna attack and kill it. Uh, your immune system is very xenophobic. No foreigners allowed whatsoever. Doesn't matter whether an innocuous foreigner or a good foreigner, foreigners are bad. Every foreigner is bad. Okay. Okay, passive transport, diffusion across membrane. Well, I know about diffusion. I think you've, you've uh, covered diffusion uh, in other biology classes, but it's important and we're gonna go through it again. So molecules constantly vibrate in water randomly at any, at any temperature. Uh, and usually the hotter the temperature, the more violently uh, they vibrate and wander. Uh, the colder, the less this, uh, they do so. Diffusion is the movement of molecules to spread out evenly into available space. In other words, from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration to make it e equal. So it's higher over here and lower over here. So molecules move over here to make things equal, to go to equilibrium. That's what, uh, uh, what the force is. Um, and it's passive because the cell does not have to use cellular energy to do this. You don't need to use ATP. Uh, molecules will do this all by themselves. Um, uh, just a the thermal energy uh, you know, the heat around is enough to do it. All right. In passive transport, concentration diffuses down as concentration gradient from where a substance is more concentrated to where it's less concentrated, as I said. So, um, and so, uh, uh, so what do you need for diffusion to occur? Or what I should, should say, net diffusion. Net diffusion is uh, more molecules moving in one direction than the other direction, right? Uh, you need, first you need uh, a, uh, um, you need a, a, the, uh, the uh, uh, molecule to be um, permeable. A permeable means the, uh, this molecule can cross the membrane. If it can't cross the membrane, we can't talk about diffusion. Right? So it's got to be permeable. And then uh, you also have to have a concentration gradient. It has to be a, a difference in concentration across the membrane. OK, so here we go. Net diffusion uh, up top. You got molecules that die on one side uh, uh, and none on the other side. It's a concentration gradient. This this. This uh, membrane is permeable to this red molecule. So we have net diffusion. Uh, the red molecules are gonna go uh, from the left to the right until they reach equilibrium right here, if they can reach equilibrium. Once they reach, each, reach equilibrium, technically the diffusion is still occurring. You're still gonna have molecules going back and forth, but the equal movement, um, 
every time one goes from the from from the left to the right, one will go from the right to the left. And um, so you still have diffusion, but no net diffusion. And the and the concentrations of those molecules will never change. Okay, that's equilibrium. Okay. Uh, now on the bottom we have two molecules. Uh, the blue one, uh, blue one, and the red one. Now the blue one is more concentrated on the left, and the red is more concentrated on the right. And they're both permeable, and they will both diffuse back and forth until the, until both reach equilibrium. And those are independent events; they have nothing to do with each other. All right. So it doesn't matter what side they're more concentrated on; uh, they will go left to right or right to left, just depending upon the direction of the concentration gradient. And they will go independently and do this uh, independent of each other. All right. Okay, substances that do not cross membrane spontaneously or otherwise cross very slowly can be transported by proteins that act as corridors for a specific molecule. It's assisted transport called facilitate diffusion. Okay, so technically you can't really talk about the, the uh, regular diffusion except for nonpolar molecules. Nonpolar molecules come across the membrane uh, without any assistance whatsoever because they are nonpolar and they, the, the, the uh, cell membrane is a nonpolar structure. So like steroid hormones come right across. Any kind of fat goes right across, okay? But remember, if it's polar, you can't get across. So anything that's polar is blocked. Anything that's polar has to have a membrane, uh, a, a, a membrane protein to allow it to cross. And so this may be just substances like ions. Ions have full charges, they gotta have a, a membrane protein. Um, amino acids and uh, glucose. Glucose is a, a polar molecule, has to have a glucose transport molecule to bring it across. So this is called passive. Uh, this is called facilitated diffusion. When you need a, when you need a membrane protein to do it. Um, and why is it still called diffusion? Because it still follows the concentration gradient. It's always from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration. So that's what makes it diffusion. Okay. Uh, that's what makes it passive, a form of passive transport. Okay, we've been talking about the uh, diffusion or facilitate diffusion of solutes. Well, what about the solvent, water? Can, the, does it diffuse? Well, it's a molecule and it has concentration gradients. Yeah, it, it diffuses uh, all by itself. It, it's a form of passive transport, but it gets a special name. If it's a, a diffusion of the sol, a solvent and that's called osmosis, right? So, uh, so in a solute is a substance that's dissolved in the solvent uh, and that's called a solution. Okay, osmosis and a force called osmotic pressure. A very important um, a force in nature and could be a dangerous force in nature, particularly for animals, which I'm gonna explain in a moment. Okay, so if you have a lower concentration of solutes, that's called hypotonic. A higher concentration is called hypertonic. And here's the relationship. Um, so you can talk about a water concentration. What's the water concentration of this solution? All right. Well, here's the, um, the uh, relationship. The, the more um, solute dissolved in the water, the lower the water concentration. Uh, so let me explain that to you. Uh, there's lots of ways you can, you can um, uh, measure concentration of substances. Uh, they have names, uh, names like molarity, molality, molality, milliequivalence, equivalents, it's a bunch of them. Easiest one is percent solution. So if you have a, a, a beaker of pure water, 100 grams, 100 milliliters, which is the same as 100 grams, of pure water, 
You have 100% water, right? Okay, take a, one gram of salt, dissolve it in the water. Now you have 1% salt, right? You put one gram of salt in 100 grams of water, you have a 1% saline solution. Well, what's the water concentration in that saline solution? No longer 100%, is it? What is it? 99%. That's the equal 100, right? You put five grams of salt in 100 grams of water. 5% saline, 95% water. Let's take a gram of sugar, put it in that 5% uh, saline solution. Now you have a 5% saline solution, a 1% glucose solution, and a 94% water solution. Is that six grams in 100? And you, that's the same too with every solute that goes in there. Every solute that goes in there lowers the water concentration, all right? Okay. So you have this, uh, this U-shaped uh, tube, you got the water and you got this green molecule. Now this green molecule, is not permeable that there's a membrane there between two sides of the U-shaped tube. That membrane is not permeable to the green molecule, but it is permeable to water. So if you have on this side, a lower concentration of solute than on this side, you have a greater concentration of water on that side, right? On the left side than the right side. So what's gonna happen? This is what's gonna happen water is gonna travel through that membrane from a region of high concentration, hypotonic, to a region of low concentration, hypotonic. And the level of water on the left will drop and the level of water on the, on the right will rise. Um, and this is called osmotic pressure. Osmotic pressure is the force um, caused by the movement of water along its concentration gradient. And it's a very important uh, force, as I mentioned. And it'll go until it reaches uh, what's called isotonic, equal concentration of water on both sides. That's what it's trying to go to because it's a form of diffusion. So you wanna go to equilibrium. So on the right is equilibrium. Same water concentration on the, on the right as on the left. Okay. So compared to another solution, the hypertonic has a higher concentration of solute. A hypotonic solution has a lower concentration of solute. And an isotonic uh, solution has an equal concentration of solute. So, and you can look at it um, that way too. A hypertonic solution has a higher concentration of solute, but lower water concentration. Hypotonic, lower concentration of solute, higher water concentration, isotonic, equal concentration of solute and equal concentration of water. So the survival of a cell depends on its ability to balance water uptake and loss. Because uh, all the cells in your body, in the animal body, are permeable to water. Because they have these proteins called aquaporins and they're water transport proteins. So water goes to facilitate diffusion uh, back and forth. Uh, across cell membranes, depending upon what side of the cell has a higher water concentration. So if we're able to survive a hypotonic or hypertonic environment, the animal must have a way to balance the uptake and loss of water. Particularly important for animals. Why? We don't have a cell wall. We don't have a cell wall. So if we get a higher water concentration outside of our cells than inside, water will rush into cells and cause it, the cells to swell. If the water concentration outside of cells is lower than water concentration inside of cells, water will rush out of cells and the cells will shrivel up. So we have to make sure as an animal that the water concentration on both sides of your cells is, is equal. That's, uh, is, uh, so, so that our body fluids are isotonic. That's called osmoregulation. Okay, and the osmotic environments for plants and animals are quite different. So you got an animal cell here. Normal is isotonic, same amount of water inside as outside. So whenever a water molecule comes in, a water molecule leaves and the cell stays the same shape. Plant cells, however, don't like that. 
uh, a plant cell will be wilted, flaccid, if it's in an isotonic environment. Okay, hypotonic environment. The water concentration outside the cell is higher than it is inside. And water will rush in and try to sell the, uh, swell the cell. And if it's hypotonic enough, it will cause the cell to burst, lysed. And that's been the death of the cell. This is what happens if you drink too much water. I mean, way too much water. It, it'll cause your, your brain cells to swell up and burst and it'll kill you. It's called hyponatremia. But, but plants actually like it. They like the hypotonic solution. Their body fluids are hypotonic to their cells. It makes them turgid and they don't explode because they have a cell wall, see? Okay, hypertonic shrivel. The water concentration uh, outside is lower. So this is like severe dehydration and water is sucked out of your cells and, they, and the cells shrivel up. The same thing will happen to a plant cell. So hypertonic solution is dangerous to both plant and animal cells, but hypotonic solution is only dangerous to animal cells because plant cells have a cell wall. So plant cells have rigid cell walls. Plant cells are healthiest in a hypotonic environment. The net inflow of water, which expands your cell walls without bursting and they're nice and turgid. That's part of like the, the, the cell skeleton. So when an animal cell shrivels, when, when it is hypotonic to its environment. In fact, its environment is hypertonic. So water sucked up. The cells are a wilted plant uh, uh, both the uh, plant are uh, uh, also hypertonic uh, uh, compared to uh, 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 hypotonic compared to the environment because water is coming out and the uh, plant is wilted when there's not, when there's not enough water outside. So there's plant turgor, wilted on the left, turgid on the right, so you could be isotonic on the, on the left, hypotonic on the right. The uh, plant uh, body fluids. Okay, uh, you have to transport, uh, so let's, let's uh, call it here and we'll pick up back to transport on the next uh, 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 lecture. So this one would be 106 working cells two. All right, I'll see you on the next one.